Hey, welcome back to episode 187 of the Guardian Project podcast. And I am the real conduit of worlds, Andy. And I am a recent mere convert, Mike Coyle. Please listen carefully. And this is the podcast about Commander, our favorite Magic the Gathering format. And this week, we are going to look at some articles that came out over the past few weeks from Mark Rosewater, where he talks about the storm scale. So this is uh, predictions on the likelihood of repeating mechanics that we saw. um, And we're going to talk about mechanics from Throne of Eldraine all the way through Strixhaven. Yes. Um, Oh, I don't remember the last time we talked about it. It's been, I mean, probably at least a year, I would imagine. Or more. This is thrown. I bet you. I bet you it was even more than that. It might have I been. I wonder. I'm gonna guess episode eighty three. Eighty three. Did you already I'll look it up? Look. No, oh, I okay. literally that, have no that, idea. That'd have been very clever of you to have looked it up ahead of time. Been exactly I'm gonna right. guess the exact episode that it was. <laughs> Hey, we have a new patron, Jonathan Santos. Thank you so much for your subscription and for becoming part of the project. Yes, welcome to the project. Um, you have no role on the team, but uh, you still get a paycheck. So That's great. We get paid? Well, Do you get paid? No, but no. I mean, like in this hypothetical situation where the project is not a school project and actually a work project and you're employed. I guess technically every project pays if it results in you getting a job from it, right? In a way, unless it's an unpaid internship that your job is. The unpaid internships are unacceptable. (laughs) I agree. They should be outlawed. I also agree. There's, that is, it's robbery. We're taking we're taking a left turn, and I'm gonna I'm veering I'm getting I'm getting back on track because it was too I important could, not to give it three words. Though. I could I could do an entire rant. On, oh yeah. No, we don't do unpaid internships. <laughs> you get paid for things that you do for people. But um, hey, if yeah. you if you if you don't have the money though, and you want uh, to so if you have an unpaid internship as your job and you want to support us, you can head on over to whatever platform you're currently, head on over to the platform you're currently listening on, but you're already there. Um, and you could subscribe, rate, review, and leave comments, and we'd be really appreciative. Yeah, you can find us online at theguardianprojectpodcast.com. We stream on Twitch occasionally. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and on YouTube. And you can email us at guardianprojectpod at gmail.com. And if you are working an unpaid internship, let us know, because we will will help you find something that pays you. Yeah, send us an email from your unpaid internship because you should be sending those emails on company time. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Hey, uh, is Stormy Daniels still like a relevant joke for a transition? (laughs) All right. Uh, It's been a really long time since we talked about the storm scale. So for those of you who are not familiar, it is a scale from one to 10, one being a mechanic that is basically guaranteed to return, like flying, and 10 being a mechanic that is so powerful, it's unlikely to return to the point of, quote, needing a major miracle like storm or dredge almost, uh, as Mark Rosewater says. So determine, to determine where a mechanic falls on the storm scale, he's going to use the following criteria. So the first is popularity. Did players like the mechanic? The more the players like something, the more likely they are to bring it back. The less they like it, the less likely it is to return. So this metric is covering really the question, was it fun? Um, And he looks at it from a lens of very popular, popular, liked, and then unpopular. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the next criteria is design space. How many more cards could we design with this mechanic? Design space is important because if we can't make more cards, it doesn't matter how much players like it or how easy it is for development to balance. This lens will have three labels, large, medium, and small. So how niche is the mechanic? I believe that we want more cards to split second. I hope its design space is <clears throat> large. It's it's not. Probably not. No. Nope. Uh, it's not on this list, but I would like to see that come back. <laughs> Versatility is next. How well does the mechanic mix and match with other mechanics? Does it require a lot of infrastructure or does it require minimal support? In short, does it make design easier or harder? And he says the lens has three labels, flexible, neutral, and rigid. Next criteria is development slash play design. How easy is this mechanic to cost? How easy is it to balance? How easy is it to make this mechanic? This lens looks at whether the mechanic can be easily developed and balanced. This lens has three labels, not problematic, neutral, or problematic. So this is 
how hard is it uh, to make the Wizard of the Coast employees jobs? You know, what's funny after like reading through these articles many times, I feel like there's so much to like designing a game that I would never have thought of. Right. Because I was it was never like anywhere on like a career path I was ever sure. looking at. But it's wild to see all the factors that go into it's it because there's a lot that goes mm -hmm. into this game. And finally, the, the the last criteria is playability. Did players have problems under, understanding the mechanic, both in how it worked and how it interacted with other mechanics? Was it logistically hard to use? Did it have memory issues? Does it require play aids like the exert tokens we used to get like mm -hmm. you know does or it require tokens. or tokens in general um and this lens look at looks at whether a mechanic has some barrier that made it harder to play and it has uh two labels playability not added uh, or affected and playability is affected so starting out we have adamant adamant was from throne of eldraine adamant says if at least x color of a mana was spent uh to cast the spell you gain or, or you get an added bonus so for example rally of the throne is an instant for two and a white it says you make two humans uh but if at least three white mana was spent to cast this you also gain one life for each creature you control so you get added benefit for spending sp specific colors of mana and this this mechanic was unliked the design space though is medium so uh the article says this is one of those mechanics that seems to have more design space than it really does not because you couldn't make cards with it but because it's a bit trickier to make a card that will play with it um the versatility is neutral uh he said it would only really go on a set though that has a monocolor theme so we've been seeing a lot of two color even streets new capenna had mm -hmm. three colors um so you need you need less colors uh the development play design was neutral um he said he he talked with some folks that were on the play design team specifically andrew brown and they said that adamant had some challenges one is the mana bases have to be correct to test it and monocolor themes are harder on mana needs than you might originally think mm -hmm. um playability was not affected though because there's no special rules issues it's just it's written on the card which what you do but i thought this was wild it's storm scale seven which is higher on the storm scale it says the biggest strike against this mechanic is that it just it it doesn't have many fans it had a few challenges but nothing that they couldn't do if they really wanted to but the best chance for this to return is in a set with a monocolor theme where it fits like exactly a specific role that mm -hmm. they're looking for makes sense do you run any uh adamant cards at all not a single one i would really like to like my my biggest gripe with adamant cards is i never feel like the uh the payoff is enough uh when you pay for the three mana in a monocolor deck even i feel like there's just better cards that fill the same slots most of the time yeah i don't i don't run it at all and that's adamant for you but uh, i i honestly hope if they do bring it back they bring it back in a more uh a smaller sense like in a commander deck and it's a, a much stronger version of an adamant listen card. i'm a i'm a huge proponent of monocolor cards yeah. and monocolor commander decks mm -hmm. so if if they give me some you know crazy powerful adamant cards yeah i'll throw them right in i have no problem paying three or four green when i'm only playing a green deck yeah it's fine. It's, when exactly. I'm in a two color deck, I would even say adamant still super doable. It's pretty. It's it, it can be challenging. I know drafting. I never triggered adamant in draft with Throne of Eldraine. So um, I guess in a constructed format, it would be easier. But yeah, yeah, it looks like there were there were 18 cards with adamant, but even the colorless ones were just required like like the three clockwork of, three servant of three color. of any one color mm -hmm. but we didn't I, I there was not a single rare adamant card so it was literally a draft oh that's like, why oh you yeah. know what? there were only 17 because dog tar the adamant showed up in my search here. so <laughs> so yeah it, it, there wasn't a rare maybe if they had had a, some rare ones that mm -hmm. had like crazy push designs yeah, maybe but definitely yeah adamant I didn't expect it to be at a seven, though. No, no, I didn't. Um, so another mechanic here from Throne of Eldraine, but also showed up in Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate this year, was Adventures. So this is a very popular mechanic. Adventure is one of the best rated mechanics of all time. I love it. And players absolutely adored it. And um, we got a brand new commander in Battle for Baldur's Gate in the Bant color scheme. So green, white, blue. Uh, that cares about adventures. Yeah, Gorian Wise Mentor. Super cool card. Whenever you cast an adventure, 
you get to copy it. So mm -hmm. you go on two adventures at once. Yeah, I guess, uh, I'm sorry, I did skip over adventure. If you're not familiar with adventure, uh, an adventure card is a card that has two different modes of being able to cast it. Uh, it has its adventure side, which used to be in Throne of Eldraine, only an instant or a sorcery, but now we actually have, um, or sorry, it was an instant and sorcery on one side and then a creature on the other, but now we actually have non-creature uh, on the other side with Battles of Baldurgate. Um, but it, it's a card where you can cast it for its adventure cost. It goes into a special exile zone called On an Adventure, in which case you can still cast it for its creature side or its permanent side now that we have Battle for Baldur's Gate at a later time at sorcery speed. Um, or you can cast it directly from your hand for the creature side. Uh, so yeah, very popular mechanic. Uh, the design space is very large. It's a very open-ended mechanic. It fits in pretty much any theme. There's always going to be stuff where you can probably cast something for uh, a story and then the object or creature that goes with the I also the just story. love two cards on one, like yeah, the fuse split cards, cards, split cards, aftermath cards. I just love two. MDFC. Two, MD, two cards on one piece of cardboard. Oh, mm -hmm. sign me right up. Yeah, it's very, very good. Uh, versatility is neutral. Um, it doesn't particularly play well or not play well with any other mechanics. In fact, it includes a lot of other mechanics. Um, development play design is also neutral. Uh, playability, uh, playability is not affected. So the, the cards themselves um, explain themselves and you don't need any extra cards or extra indicators, uh, which puts this at a storm scale of three. It's a home run mechanic that the players adore. Yes, it comes with a little bit of work on the design side, but nothing we can't handle. It's a mechanic that we expect to keep returning, which I think we're all happy about. Yeah, I like the adventure mechanic. Gorian the Wise, or Gorian, not Wise, Gorian Wise Mentor mm -hmm. is the Bant uh, commander that came out with Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate. Um, I... I think I said at one point that I thought adventure was a parasitic mechanic and maybe it's a little less parasitic than, than I initially thought at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of casting stuff from exile when it came out though. And we've had a ton of support for that since then we have. And I, I also, I run, um, some, some adventure cards. I run Embra Shieldbreaker. Um, it's it's a human knight, but when you send it on an adventure, it says battle display. You destroy target artifact mm -hmm. for one red, and then it's just then it's just a two one. I like having you know the spell and then you know a creature to follow up later. I mean, I I play Brazen Borrower, but I think that's the only adventure card that I play. Like the most expensive adventure card they've printed because I like bouncing things and having flash speed flying creatures. Yeah, adventure is fun. I'm glad it's 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 a three here because I would like to see it again. Agreed. Next is food tokens, which we saw originally Throne of Eldream, but we have it in Commander 2021, Modern Horizons 2, Streets of New Capenna, and even last year in Infinity. Um, so they said that the food tokens were liked and the design space was large as artifact tokens are easy to design around they can be the byproduct of many different things um mark says that food tokens want to be as flavorful as possible <laughs> with the pun intended um that they're super flexible because life gain is about as universal as things come so food having food is great i mean sometimes you just need you know, three life. Mm -hmm. um, the development play design is neutral. Uh, they said life life gain can slow gameplay down if not used carefully. So they have to ensure that it's not just about adding life to the game. This is likely far more related to like a draft or a, a constructed sure, sure. environment that's, that's not necessarily commander. We're mm -hmm. looking at this from a commander perspective. Um, playability is affected though. It said food tokens are tokens, so you must have a way to represent them. They're straightforward though, other than you have to represent them and the storm scales too because people like them and they expect to see them a lot in the future and that um he said that i should note that the token cost having to make a token that will appear in a set um will make them think twice though about including it so it's not something that's going to show up super frequently because they physically have to have that token mm -hmm. in the set it's it's funny to hear a statement like that and then immediately get blood tokens a year later and probably constantly get new tokens uh with new mechanics like that uh it's seemingly annually at the very least um, i mean my favorite food though of all is ginger brew because sure. it is a it food is. golem yeah and you can sack it to gain the three life but it's very good in some decks yeah because it can't be blocked unless the blocking creature has haste because he's a gingerbread man and catch me run run fast you can can't catch me <laughs> that's how it goes <laughs> well 
on that note, let's talk about one of the most controversial mechanics of Magic's entire history. It might be my most disliked mechanic of all time. Yeah, it's I'm um, it's up mostly there for... because I don't like limiting uh the way that I play commander when I get to play commander mm -hmm. and it none of the cards really drew me in. Mm -hmm. and that's just me though. I certainly understand though folks wanting to have this. Yeah. Yeah, I know I personally like building on a restriction sometimes which you are required to do in order to have a companion for your deck so in icoria layer of behemoths we got the companion uh which if you read any card that says companion it won't actually give you the actual rules of companion um which is we'll get to in a second but companion is a card that exists outside of your deck and outside of your command zone in exile that you have access to if you've built your deck around a certain uh restriction that each companion has uh, and what it allows you to do is pay three generic mana at sorcery speed to take your companion from the companion zone and put it into your hand, in which case you can use it any way that you would like to use it after that. Um, the original companion rule allowed you uh, to cast it directly from the companion zone onto the battlefield. Yeah, so you just got to cast it. For those of you that do run companions, if you do like having cards that <clears throat> are not conflicting with their rules, if you mm -hmm. do get the borderless versions... Mm -hmm. The reminder they text reminder isn't on text. it, That's so nice. so you're you're not impacted there. It's true, but if you don't have the full art, it does have a wrong rule on it now. Yes, yes. Um, so let's talk about how popular uh, Companion was. It was unpopular. It was one of the lowest rankings of any mechanic since we started doing ratings. Part of this is that we made a huge mistake balancing them, and they were causing problems across almost all constructed formats. Um, with Loris being banned in every format, but standard, I think, for constructed and commander and commander. That's you true. You can play with Loris. Loris was not. Banned we just saw Loris. That's just, true. But as a commander, not as a companion. Not as a companion. Uh, but you can still play it as a companion because we don't ban things as certain things in commander, which is cool. Design space is very small, Compan except for Lutri, which is banned as companion. Which is which is banned. Period. Yeah, it's not banned as companion. but yeah, it's that just one's banned. banned. That was just, which is yeah. sad. Uh, free Lutri. Mm, yeah. It's very, ah, man. But like also, Lutri is free. So it's like free Lutri. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the design space is very small. Uh, companions require effects that are interesting to build around while being something the opponent can monitor to make sure you're following the limitation. We made 10 in Ikoria and we're already running out of available space. So I'm dubious about how much space remains for the mechanic. The versatility is neutral. Companions don't have a lot of structural needs, but usually want to make sure that you're asking for has some support in the set, especially if you do some, something at uncommon, which will impact limited. Um, the development play design is problematic. Uh, never have they needed to revise a, 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 an entire mechanics ruling before, and they did for Companion. It was kind of a disaster if you played standard during that time you you experienced gyruda standard i heard modern and legacy had lots going on oh yeah with with companions it's i remember so yorian and standard was like should i play a deck that doesn't have yorian and like i remember the tcg articles were like no yeah you should always <laughs> no, play you yorian. should just be playing yorian yeah. apparently i didn't play standard that much mm -hmm. when Coria was out we had just like i think that was in the height of like the pandemic yeah, like, it was we, like mm -hmm. and that was when a lot of people were playing. Yeah. But I remember Companion was, it was a lot. Mm -hmm. It was so much fun to, to cast Garuda and get a clone and realize your opponent's also playing Garuda and then stealing all of their clones. And it was just Ooh. a mirror matchup every single time. It was fantastic. The playability of Companion. Playability is affected. Um, there are rules issues. There's memory issues. There's logistical issues. Uh, it makes the opponent feel that they must carefully monitor what's in the other player's deck. And it's a mechanic with a lot of baggage. Um, but surprisingly, it doesn't make it as a 10 on the storm scale. Um, but uh, Mark is wondering why it is not a 10 on the storm scale. Um, so this, these, these ratings if not, are, are a little bit of a collaborative effort. So it's not just Mark giving these ratings. Um, but Mark is wondering why this is not a 10. Um, so I guess there is... Maybe just a tiny little chance that companion. Yeah, it comes was back. given a nine. It was given a nine, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, I guess they, they, you know, it said public interest maybe could bring it back. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, next is cycling. 
Uh, Urza Saga had this. Onslaught, Time Spiral, Shards of Alara, Amonkhet, Modern Horizons, Ikoria, and just last year, Streets of New Capenna. So cycling's cool. Cycling allows you to discard the card and draw a card um, by paying whatever the cost is for cycling. Uh, some commanders let you do it for free. We had Gabby Nest Warden, so it's super popular, at least on a Just Guy commander. Um, sometimes you just don't want the card that you had in your hand, and you would rather have something else. Shark Typhoon, super popular card in mm -hmm. commander, has cycling. Popularity is popular. Uh, cycling has been a beloved mechanic um, that has dropped in time uh, on the popularity of their ratings, but not because people don't like it, but just because it's become more and more familiar. So when it comes back, it's cool, but it's not like the new hotness. Sure. It's like, this is this is cool. I like seeing it. The design space, though, is large. Uh, he says that cycling has about as big of design space as they come. It can go on any card type, can be tweaked a lot, and they never have to worry about coming up and designing new cycling cards. Mm -hmm. It's flexible because a card could just have like one cycling card or a whole theme for people to build around. And the designers also really like using cycling. Sure. <clears throat> the play design is neutral. Uh, they said the, the 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 experiment with a bunch of cycling cards in Ikoria showed that there were ways to cause balance problems. The good news is that because they've used it so often, they have a pretty good understanding of just how it interacts with the game elements. Playability is not affected because there's really no rules issues it's just you do what the card says mm -hmm. and then the storm scales three uh so that's pretty likely it's going to come back again uh he says as the streets of new capenna cycling's become deciduous so uh people can use it when they want to design in a set um they thought about moving it to a two which is even more popular uh or uh i guess likely that it would come back mm -hmm. which is where most uh of those deciduous mechanics live but mark said he kept it at at um a three because you know he doesn't he didn't think he would use it as often as some other tools. I still need my enemy cycling dual lands. So uh, there better be a one on the storm scale because I want it in my next set. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next up, also a set, uh, a mechanic from Ikoria. Uh, one that I really liked at the beginning and have grown neutral to over time. And I will say this one has caused a lot of discussion on Twitter mm -hmm. because there are people that say, I would rather play against this or I would like to play. And, and I remember I tweeted this and there were a couple other people, but when this is in a game, I, I feel very much like there's always a judge ruling. There's always a question. When we had Judge Anthony on to talk about mechanics, yeah. we gave examples of cards we'd like to put this on. Yeah. And every time... It was a human, yeah. which it doesn't work with. Which it doesn't work because with. Because the mechanic is mutate. That's correct. That's correct. So mutate um, is an alternate casting cost for a creature that you have that allows you to put it over or under that non-human creature that you are mutating with, um, which allows you to have the power and toughness and keywords of uh, the top or sorry, just the power and toughness and name of the top creature and all of the text boxes of every creature that is below it. This has had decks where you can find a way to put all your cards into your command zone. I yes. saw that. Um, it had a commander that always seems to just be doing nothing and then you just can't stop it. And mm -hmm. that, I mean, it's cool, but mm -hmm. that happens. Yeah. Um, also, the one thing we learned in that episode was uh, mutate goes on non-humans non and i remember only. it because when i he's when i see mutate i go non-human mm -hmm. and then i always find a really cool card i want to mutate onto yeah. and it's always a stink i think human. last week we just talked about how it's like oh yeah maybe we'll turn the the tyranid deck or something into a mutate deck but there's freaking humans in the tyranid deck too so god get it together get tyranids. it together warhammer 40k lore that's been around for 20 years popularity of mutate is liked mutate is very polarizing players who like it adore it and the players who don't like it don't like it uh, i know i just said i was neutral on it so apparently i'm not captured in this demographic yeah you're in the middle you gotta always be different but i didn't I am try the, to i am in the eh, not a fan yeah i guess if it came back i would say that's cool yeah. i mean <clears throat> but if it didn't I wouldn't be mad. I don't know if I'd want to see another standard set with it. I think I would want it to come back in a much smaller version. But okay. yeah, design space is medium. Mutate's a good example of a mechanic with a lot of potential, but far less that would lead to good gameplay. It does have a big enough design space that a future set could take it in a bit different direction. All, all you need is non-humans. Um, versatility is rigid. Um, you can't just throw one mutate card into a set and have a mutate set. Uh, it's, as we talk about, kind of a parasitic mechanic. Um, something that requires a lot of support. 
Uh, development and play design is neutral. Um, is one mechanic, I was most surprised that it was not labeled problematic. Said that the biggest issue with making mutate cards isn't doing it within the biosphere of its limited environment. That wasn't as hard as was assumed, but getting it to interact with everything around it in sets that weren't designed with mutate in mind. As we just talked about, cloning your mutate creature piles or putting them into stinking, the command there's zone. There's that stinking bird. I think it was a bird. And it was like, every time you mutate, you bounce something. And I was yeah. like, stop playing this bird because I don't want to bounce something again. Yeah. And you just can't. So like, well, I mutate onto the bird, but yeah. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to mutate again. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, I'm going to mutate a third time all in one turn. You're like, well, I guess I, I guess I got hull breached by this. That's true. Hull breached. No. Hull yeah. breach. Hull breached. No, hull breached works. You yeah. got your hull breached. Breaching your hull. <laughs> Uh, playability here. Playability is affected. Um, mutate is a contention for the most complex mechanic rules wise that they've ever made. A lot of players don't like it because they simply don't understand how it works in many practical situations. Putting it on the storm scale at a seven. It probably should be a little higher as it's a hard mechanic to wrangle, but it's a mechanic that's beloved by its fans. It's something I'm asked about all the time. Um, Mark is asked about all the time, so I'm eager to so he's eager to find a home for it. He's aware that it's not going to be an easy thing to do outside of a return to Ikoria, which that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. And it's also not Hull Breacher, it's Hull Breaker Horde. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but we said Hull Breacher, which is not for like actually for like know. four weeks for we've like been four saying weeks Hull we Breacher. Have. Yeah, if we didn't go back to Ikoria, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be upset. Give it a few years, and maybe I change my mind. I mean, spoiler, the Planeswalker from there might not be around. Uh-oh. Uh I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next mechanic is Kicker, which, again, we've seen it a million times in Invasion and Time Spiral. And Zendikar, Dominaria, Modern Horizons, Modern Horizons 2, Zendikar Rising, and Dominaria United. And this was here in... Uh, Zendikar Rising, which I really enjoyed that set. It was a very liked mechanic. Kicker is um, something where you, when you cast the card, uh, you get to just pay for whatever it says for Kicker and you get an extra ability. For example, uh, Skyclave Relic. It's an artifact with Kicker 3. It's just an indestructible uh, mana rock that taps for one mana of any color. But when it enters, if you also kicked it, so it costs three, but you can kick it for three, um, you get to create two tap tokens that are copies of it. So you just you you pay some more to get some more. So later in the game, it does more. Earlier in the game, does a little less. It's a liked mechanic, but just like cycling, it's gone down in time on their popularity ratings. But because people are familiar with it and they just, they like it. Uh, the design space though is large. Uh, Kicker has a humongous design space, larger than uh, Mark assumes Magic could ever use it for. It can go on any card type and has a ton of utility. And he says here, and this is funny, his biggest issue with Kicker is not what it can do, but that we design it in such, uh, that they design it such that it doesn't step on the toes of other mechanics. He's talked at length in his, his podcast and in other articles that with 2020 hindsight, they might not have done Kicker as broadly as a mechanic, but chopped it up because people say, well, that's just Kicker. Yep. Um, you know, in response to things. So adamant is like kicker, but if you did it with three, three of one, one specific man. color, of you course. know, there's a, there's a whole video on just this kicker mm -hmm. and I, and I love it. And it's very funny. Um, it's flexible and they could have uh, one kicker card in a set or build a whole theme. It is not problematic because it's kicker. Yeah. Uh, as their design, uh, you know, their, their, their teams uh, gave that feedback. Uh, the playability is not affected because it's, it's easy. You just read the rule and it's right on the card and it has storm scale three because it's easy to use plays great. And they're going to use it again and again. I love it. And we got a kicker command. We got another kicker commander, right? Mm -hmm. Cause we had uh, Hal Halar, the fire Fletcher. And yeah. then we got Verizal. Verizal. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got, we've got gruel, and Simic. And Simic. Yes. So you must have green in your kicker deck. Yeah, Vera's all the split current. And I don't see it very often, but it's also, that's one of those, it's it's parasitic in a Vera's all deck maybe. Sure. But it's cool. It is I cool. like how it plays every single time I see Verisol. I'm honestly really surprised to see this at a storm scale three and not a two, because we are going to see more of it. I, don't, I guess I'm, I'm curious on what makes it a three versus a two, but. I don't know. It's so small. It's Who up cares? to interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> the next mechanic we have on here is one that I play in probably 50% of my decks at least, and that is Landfall. You think it's 50? I bet it's more. Uh, I don't. You I, don't? I don't think maybe I play. Maybe for me it is. Yeah, maybe. Even though I just have one card that has this. 
Uh, I bet it. I don't. I I think it's I think it's less than fifty percent. All right, still, but maybe because like this first card, this first card they show here uh, definitely is in decks that don't care about landfall. Yeah, landfall true. hey oh spoiler landfall zendikar block battle for zendikar block and zendikar rising this is a zendikar specific mechanic landfall that we got um landfall is a triggered ability that is on uh any it's on many different permanent types i don't know if they've printed it on a land itself yet um but landfall is a triggered ability that happens anytime a land enters the battlefield under your control uh, for instance, Morog, Fury of Akum, has a landfall ability that says whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, if it's your main phase, there's an additional combat phase after this phase. At the beginning of that combat, untap all creatures you control. So yeah, that would be good in just like a mono red deck that like can play one land per turn. Um, so Or if you watch our stream from maybe two years ago, there was mm. a Morog uh, Goblin deck that uh, yeah. it steamrolled the table. And sure it was did. very cool. Yeah. It was yeah. a budget deck and I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Um, so popularity of Landfall. It's very much liked. Uh, it's it's a very basic mechanic. Um, it's, it's again, one of those things that's slipping in popularity just due to familiarity more than anything else. The de design space is very large. Uh, there's always going to be lands in in sets. yeah they said that they haven't done it on a sorcery though which yeah. that means they've done it on everything else that means they've done it on an instant there's landfall on an instant maybe that's crazy i want to see it <laughs> uh versatility is neutral um here's where landfall differs from cycling and kicker it requires a bit more structural support usually a set with landfall does have a few extra ways to trigger landfall so things that are going to uh, search for lands from from your library and put them on the battlefield or maybe directly put them from your hand allow you to play more lands per turn um, you'll typically see those in the sets supported with landfall which are zendikar only sets the ones that have landfall is the like an instant like groundswell is if you had a land enter this turn oh. when you cast it then you then okay. you can see so you want to play it after your land gotcha gotcha um so development and play design is not problematic uh it's just extra things that you get for for when lands enter the battlefield um, and for playability it's not affected because again it's just an extra trigger that happens when you play a land um, storm scale is three we're definitely going to see lands fall in the future will we ever see it well supported outside of a zendikar block i think is really the question honestly though the amount of landfall we see that's played in commander regularly yeah. shows just how much zendikar affects commander oh love very much it. so i would love this to come back i i'm a big fan we all put lands in our decks, so. I know. Even though I'm talking about cutting lands, I still play them just like much less than 40. Yeah. I, I'm a good 36. I've been cutting to like 35 lately, and I still feel like I'm flooding sometimes. I'm a 35 with two MDFCs. Speaking of MDFCs, sure. modal double face cards, which we saw in Zendikar Rising, Kaldheim, Strixhaven, School of Mages. Um super popular so modal double face cards are, are two-sided cards that you you can you can play it down on either side each card does something different we had in zendikar rising which were uh my favorite because i put them in i will say every single deck um are the mdfc lands so on one side it's a land that comes in tapped if it's a rare or an uncommon you can pay three life have it come in untapped if it's one of the mythics and on the other side it's a spell like seagate restoration it can either come in uh tapped uh, or you pay three life for untapped and it taps for blue mana, or it's a spell that says draw cards equal to the number of cards in your hand. You have no max hand size for the rest of the game for seven mana. Those were those were really cool. Uh, in call time, we had the MDFC gods. So I would say easily the most popular is Essica God of the Tree, which is the prismatic bridge, at least in Commander. Oh, yeah. um, Essica is a god creature that taps for mana and other legendary creatures have vigilance and they tap for mana or the prismatic bridge, which I think is the side I see most often is a five color enchantment that lets you get stuff for free and do nasty things. So it's very cool. Yeah, very and then so. finally, we had some uh, MDSCs in Strixhaven. We had the Planeswalkers, Will and Rowan, but we also had the College Deans yeah. that no one knows what... The second side of the college dean does because no one flips them they're usually like playing the one side mm -hmm. i'll be honest i i know what dean the 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 bird side of the dean does the white side but i don't know what the the other side oh, is where it's actually what's his face's dad 
Killian's dad, Killian's I think. Dad. Yeah, so the popularity of these is very, very popular or just popular. And both are marked here. It says, MDFCs were introduced in Zendikar Rising with lands on the back. They then appeared in Kaldheim on the gods. And finally, they were in Strixhaven on the deans. The land versions are the most popular. And the deans were the least popular because there were too many words on them. And wow. that's what this says. A lot of words. And it's, there were a lot of words. Mm -hmm. uh, players seem to really like MDFCs, but there are some lessons they learned, which makes them the most appealing. Uh, you just got to keep the back simple. Like just having it be a land, whether it comes in tap or untap, pretty easy. I guess. Big sure. fan. Uh, and he also wants to point out that that uh, double face cards as a category, which is like the werewolves, uh, are always very popular. True. And I love those too. Yeah, we, you talked about it just before it started. Two cards on one card? Two Perfect. cards on one card. We're here for it. Design space is large. Um, they said this is more of a tool than it is a mechanic. There's lots of things you can do with it. The biggest issue is the cho is the is is really is is, is powerful is is choice, right? right? So you have to figure out what you're going to do. Um, and the two sides must be costed with that in mind, which does have some impact on what you can design. Uh, he says there's also conversations to be had about when to use it versus split cards. Um, their current policy is to avoid double face cards. That could just be split cards like Fuse or Aftermath or something. Uh, they are very flexible. The reason you don't want MDFC in every set is mostly about production and logistics rather than game design. So it being in a set doesn't doesn't cause the set to change much, mechanically speaking, but you know, you have to print on two sides of cards. Yeah. Uh, the development play is neutral and not problematic. They said the play design does a lot of spells with choices like split cards with kicker. So MDFCs really aren't adding something to the table they aren't familiar with. But the, the trickiest MDFCs to balance are the lands, though, as their play design is very time consuming because there's a lot of numbers to figure out. Um, always play the ones with lands. They're great. Every deck. Uh, they can replace a basic. I promise you. I've done it. I, I am curious on how long it took them to come up with the three life you have to pay for the mythics to come in untapped. Though. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. And it wasn't like two or I wonder if it was ever more. Right. We should. I should message him we'll on blogger Mark. talk well, well blogger talk question yeah. you know uh the playability though is affected because they require sleeves or a checklist card and there's memory issues with what's on the back of the cards mm -hmm. and some of them have weird rules interactions and then the storm scale is four so when mdfcs are done in moderation and considering how easy they are to process um and play they're, they're very popular they they also have a huge amount of flexibility allowing them to do new cool things so he's optimistic we'll see them again um and he wants to do something different than what's already been done. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, really like I really like that that's that's returning. Um, <clears throat> do you ever have any problems though with with like sleeving things up or whatnot? I actually find it kind of beneficial because if it's a legendary creature that I want to be my commander, I can put it in a clear sleeve and then just like play either side of it. Yeah. Um in my double sleeve decks, no. In mm -hmm. my single sleeve decks, which is <laughs> are most of them now, because I've undoubled sleeved the majority sure. of my decks. Um sometimes you don't want to pull the mythic out. Yeah. But not really. Okay. Fair enough. All right. So another mechanic from Zendikar Rising, one that, well, let's see if it got a lot of love. I like this mechanic. I don't know if anyone else did. It's party because party, party. Uh, party is a mechanic that cared about uh, having a certain number of specific creature types uh, that you control at a time. Um, specifically, party is looking at warriors, wizards, clerics, and rogues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you had uh, one of each if I, I might actually be missing one still because I feel like there was five party members and you only had to have four of them um, it's cleric rogue warrior and wizard okay it's just four just four so just if you had four. if you um, so there's there's different mechanics uh, that will give you extra things if you actually have um, party um, one that I actually play uh, in I used to play in my changeling stack back in the day was coveted prize as an example here uh, it's normally four and a black for a sorcery that allows you to search your library for a card put it in your hand and shuffle your library um, but the spell costs one generic less to cast for each creature in your party and has an extra effect if you have a full party you may cast a spell with converted mana cost four or less from your hand without paying its mana cost mm -hmm. so you know, one black mana to cast a four mana spell from your library for free right away was always pretty cool for me. So that's party. Let's talk about the popularity of it. Uh, it was unpopular. Uh, <laughs> that was, was fast. <laughs> yeah, it, it was the least popular of the named keywords from Zendikar Rising, which makes sense to me. Um, but like Nute, it did have its fans who are quite fond of it. But overall, it was not a hit with players. 
The design space is medium slash small. Obviously it requires these four specific creature types and you have to be able to support all of them. Um, some of them are very generically supported like warriors and wizards and they'll be supported in every set. Um, but sometimes it's harder to fit in uh, creature types like cleric. Um, so, uh, and to have all of them uh, in even an equal amount in a set is right. going to be very hard. Versatile is rigid. So party re requires a lot of structure to support it. Like I just said, having all four of those creature types and being able to support all four of those creature types uh, together can be difficult. Development and play design is problematic. Um, so this was one of only two mechanics that were dubbed problematic in this entire list. Party requires a lot of support to be viable and it's dependent on a heavy creature-based strategy that's hard to make work in competitive formats. I mean, I don't think I ever saw party in any sort of competitive format, um, but as commander players, we saw an entire commander pre-con um, that, that, that could care about party. Um, well, no, it's called party time. Yeah, that's what the deck's called, the Black White uh, Baldur's Gate deck, Party Time. Playability, uh, it is affected um, because you have to keep track of all of the creature types that you have, whether or not it's going to be uh, on or off. Um, so that puts it at the Storm Scale of 8. So this is very high. This is way higher than I thought it was going to be on here. Um, but it's not really that much liked, and it's hard to balance, so it's not a recipe to return. Yeah. Um, the next Snap-on Equipment, which I, I guess I forgot that this was like a, a specific thing that was, you know, there was some focus here, but we've seen this previously in Ravnica, Mirrodin, Besieged, Ixalan, Throne of Eldraine. Um, so it's on this list here as uh, Snap-on Equipment, which is equipment that when it enters, you get to automatically attach it. So there's there's cards that let you do that. Like when when the cards are out, uh, the Hammer of Nizan is one of them. When it enters, you can just attach it to something. But uh, one example is Maul of the Skyclaves for uh, two and a white mana. It's an artifact equipment. When it enters, uh, attach it to target creature. That creature gets plus two, plus two as flying and first strike. And equip is two white, white. So you can just equip it like regular, but you get the free equip. It snaps right on, which mm -hmm. is great. And they're popular. Uh, players like equipment, but aren't always overly excited about it. Snap on equipment is on the higher end of the equipment that players enjoy. Players like getting things for free. Um, and I like I like getting things for free. Of course. I, I like love, free. I love a bargain. No strings attached. No strings attached. The design space, though, is medium. Most equipment could snap on. So the design space is of decent size. Uh, there are some, uh, he says, in research and development that believe all equipment should snap on because they think it plays better. Yeah. But the other side believes that equipment already feels better than auras that um, and that the free attach would just make auras feel even worse than auras already feel. Hmm. Okay. So I can I can see that sure. they are flexible. Um, you can have any number of equipment and any of them could snap on. So it doesn't really do much to the set. Uh, the play design is not problematic because it's easy to balance and it plays well. Um Playability is not affected, no major rules issues, and storm scales too. Equipment is evergreen, so it can be used everywhere, whenever you want. And they said that they'd, they'd refer to snap-on equipment as deciduous, so that a designer can use it when they want to use it. Um, and any set with equipment can consider using it. Do you prefer snap-on equipment or ETB, it creates a token creature, equip this to that token creature? So you're talking like the germ tokens that mm -hmm. I would rather have snap-on. What if it wasn't a 0-0? Zero, zero? What if it was a 1-1? One, one? If it was a 10-10, no, I'm <laughs> uh, No, I would still rather have this because those, I don't know, these do, there's more, there's, there's more variety these in snap-ons. Uh, snap-ons, I think, care about being equipment more than the other ones, so I do agree with yeah. you. All right, Boast from Kaldheim is our next mechanic. Boast was uh, a, an ability that you could pay for at a very certain time while you're uh, attacking or after you're attacking um, in order to get an extra ability. So Yeah, you can do it like during combat. Yes. Yeah. So Varagoth Or Blood... after combat. <laughs> Varagoth Bloodsky Sire, for example, is a 2-3 creature with Death Touch and Boast for one and a black. Target player searches their library for a card, then shuffles their library and puts that card on top. Hey, of that's it. Vampiric Tutor. It sure is, but without having to pay life, which is even better. Um, so... Um, let's talk about how popular this mechanic was. It's not popular. Uh, Boast fell in the bottom 25%. So not the least popular mechanic, but we think people saw this as a drawback mechanic. It's a cool activated ability that you can't use all the time. It was meant as an attack trigger that required mana, but we understand how to implement a, a mechanic matters a great deal uh, in how it's publicly perceived. Um, so the design space is medium. Uh, obviously, all creatures are going to be attacking, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to have all creatures this boast ability because it has to make sense thematically. 
Um, and it's not always going to make sense uh, for, for all creatures out there to be boasting while attacking. Versatility is neutral. Um, again, you can put it in anything that has attacking creatures. Development and play design is non-problematic. As long as there is a creature-centric attacking um, theme, you can have a creature-centric attacking mechanic. Uh, the playability is not affected here. It's very straightforward. Um, being able to read the card, uh, activating it, it'll tell you exactly when you can activate it as long as you have one of the cards with the reminders text on there. Um, so there's very little logistical issues when it comes to it. But and I believe this is mostly uh, based on the popularity of the mechanic. They're putting it at a storm scale of six. Yeah. So it's easy to bring back. But if people don't want it, they won't. Right. Next is Changeling, which um, I think has become super duper popular over the last two, three years here. Lorwyn had it. Modern Horizons had it. Call Time had it featured heavily. Um, I use it in my creature um, creature type theme uh, based decks, so they they work in pretty much all of those as mm -hmm. well. Uh, Changeling is is a mechanic that basically says this is this is all creature types um, at all times. So that's including cool. human, including including so you human. Can't mutate on a changeling. Can't mute. Yes, you cannot mutate onto a changeling. But um, one of the more popular cards that we see uh, played Brit pretty heavily is maskwood nexus creatures you control every creature type the same is true uh for creature spells you control and creatures that you own that aren't on the battlefield and you can make uh shapeshifters with changelings so that's cool but we got lots of new stuff orvar uh, i apologize for building that at one point realm walker <laughs> great card but it's a very popular mechanic creature type themes are super popular so it comes as no surprise that this um would be a, a big hit uh, any creature could have changing mechanically if they wanted so the design space is large, um, but it would raise the cost on cards because if it's every creature type, it works with things like party or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, the versatility is neutral. Uh, he said you would not put a creature with changeling in a set unless it has a creature type theme in it. Uh, so we're going back to Ixalan soon. Maybe we could see some changelings i would be in for it we got some vampires some dino changelings well i mean merfolk changelings. they're not dino changelings or merfolk they're just changelings they're just changelings <laughs> uh the play design is neutral um it has learned over time the play design team that uh the way to balance creatures with changeling is to have it just cost a lot for the effect because Makes when sense. it does matter the effect can be quite strong especially in older formats uh playability is not affected creatures with changing force you to monitor for creature type effects but that's usually a theme your deck is dedicated to so it's probably something you're already looking for um the storm scales four because people like it and it's good glue for a creature type set something they make often so they said they'll they'll likely see it return uh probably numerous times yeah i'm, I'm hoping that we get to actually see like specific legendary creature that cares about changelings and stuff uh, more often coming into the future would be kind of cool. Um, so next mechanic here from call time, we have foretell because we're going to continue this theme of casting things from exile in this list. So um, behold the multiverse is a good example of foretell. What it allows you to do is for an alternate cost, in this case, behold the multiverse, you can foretell for one and a blue, you can exile it uh, for two generic mana, and then for one and a blue later on, you can cast that spell. You cannot cast a spell the turn that you foretell it, um, and you technically can foretell at instant speed, but you can only do it on your own turn. Uh, so um, it's a very popular mechanic. Uh, it was one of the most popular mechanics and the most popular mechanic. I do like um, it a lot. In Kaldheim, yeah. And again, we saw a lot of support from uh, casting stuff from Exile. So in Commander, uh, we care about it a lot more outside of specifically the Foretell mechanic, mm -hmm. which did have a lot of support even in the legendary creatures from Kaldheim. And it got a Commander deck. Exactly. Uh, design space is medium. Um, you know, it can go in some things. It doesn't make sense uh, everywhere. Uh, versatile is neutral for the exact same argument. Uh, development and play design also neutral for the exact same argument. Anything can be foretold. There's always going to be uh, predictions and seers and any particular set that you go in. So even thematically, it's going to make sense. Uh, playability is affected. It creates a new zone, a foretell zone. It's a face down card. It's something that probably uh, would have memory issues. You can simply pick up the card and read it, but that also would take extra time and make games a little bit longer, um, which is probably the only drawback here, putting it at a storm scale of four. So um, not quite those two and threes that we for sure will see, but Definitely, we're going to see it again. Yeah. Another popular mechanic is Snow, which we had an Ice Age, Cold Snap, Future Sight, Commander 19, Modern Horizons, and Kaldheim. I know you you got a lot of it in Modern Horizons, and I know you use a lot of snow, snow, uh, snow covered lands. Mm -hmm. But um, essentially, there are permanents that care when you have 
more snow permanents. Lands can be a, a snow land, a super type, um, and there are creatures and sorceries that care when you use snow mana or have snow permanents. Um, it's a popular mechanic. Um, he said snow ended up in the second quarter of the, the, the polling. Overall, it was a liked, but more polarizing than the average mechanic, but the design space is large. Um, but it, the versatility is more neutral slash rigid. So the argument has a lot of sway in how you judge it. If you believe snow should only show up when it's mechanically relevant, then there's a you know a restriction yeah. on when you use it. Sure. But you know you could be on the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. The development though is is neutral in play design. The current rules they only add it when it's relevant, so it adds a layer of mana requirements whenever they want to use it. But the biggest you know issue is in draft. Um, the playability is affected because it requires you to monitor your snow permanence. But it has a storm scale of five. So it's like right in the middle here. Snow has a lot of fans. They make a lot of environments where it can work. So he's confident we'll see it again, but not too frequently. Yeah, only when it thematically makes sense. From Strixhaven, we got lessons and learn. Do you use any of these? Um, I, I, oh, that's a good question. I don't think I use a single one. Yeah, it's, um, they, they use not in commander. These were, these were, well, maybe some, I might do something with learn. I can't think of it, everything with learn, um, but lessons, no, I don't run any lessons. So uh, learn is a mechanic that has, is an extra ability on a card that allows you to reveal a lesson card from outside the game. So this is in your side, your sideboard. Um, and a lesson is another uh, uh, spell type that you'll be able to have. So divide by zero is two and a blue that allows you to return a permanent uh, to its owner's hand um, with a, a restriction and allows you to learn. Uh, learn gives you a lesson. One of the most popular lessons is environmental sciences. For two generic mana, you get a sorcery. It says search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle and you gain two life. So it does give you extra advantage um, in limited and in, in uh, 1v1 constructed formats. I really like the learn format to be or the learn mechanic in order to get extra cards into my hand but in commander i don't use it very much the popularity here is it's very much liked um, because it's almost like drawing cards because you get extra cards and i love hand. doing that everyone loves doing that the design space is medium uh it, it really needs to make sense thematically but uh also it does open up um, how many cards uh, you're going to have access to in, in in a particular game. So you have to keep that in mind. The versatility is very rigid with lessons. Um, you must have things that learn so that you can get them. So it's two specific type of spells that you have to build into your set um, and fetching for them and things. Uh, it could be difficult. Uh, development play design is neutral. Um, Andrew, Andrew, or sorry, Mark said that the lessons and learn spells were not as difficult to design as they were time consuming. You have total control over what's fetchable. But there's a lot of number wrangling. Playability is affected here because you do need a side deck and commander. That's not something we used to have to do. It's becoming very popular to do nowadays, though. So you do have to have a side deck now for commander, but um, you also need to include them in your sideboards for those other formats. Putting it at a storm scale of six, something that we might see in the future, but not anytime soon. Yeah. The next is Magecraft, which is a mechanic that's probably one of my favorites on this list. I know we've talked about it briefly in the mm -hmm. past, but this came out in Strixhaven. Uh, Magecraft has whenever you cast a spell or copy an instant or sorcery, you can draw a card. We see it on creatures and we see we even see it on the planeswalker professor onyx has this oh, yeah. um they were very popular uh it was well liked uh, as was the instant and sorcery theme of Strixhaven. um the design space is medium uh they said that while they mostly design magecraft to go on permanence and it needs effects that are generally useful when you cast an instant it, you know that can limit some options it also is the type of mechanic where there's a lot of nuances in designs that play well mm -hmm. um that said, though, there's more that they could design. It's neutral in versatility that it can work in any set, but they'd want it to be where there's a higher, you know, um, volume of instants and sorceries. Sure. And it cares about copying. So maybe that, you know, should be there. Development is it's not problematic. It's they refer to it as an A B mechanic that has two elements that have to be combined in, in it to work. A is Magecraft and B is instant and sorcery. So it has to have them both. Playability is not in fact uh, affected. You just have to monitor when you're casting or mm -hmm. copying something, but it only gets a storm scale of five, which I honestly thought this would be higher, but it needs the right environment to shine, but it has a lot of design space and is easy to balance. But Archmage Emeritus, I would say I've added to most of my blue decks that are Spellslinger decks. Yeah. And I, 
I draw three, four, five cards a game on it, mm-hmm. and that's just a two-two human that it's probably not going to swing. It's just going to sit there. And so this this statement about it being easy to balance, I think, is specifically talking about one v one constructed formats and limited. Because honestly, my gripe with Magecraft is I think it's not balanced in Commander. I think it's an extremely strong mechanic in Commander. Yeah, Stormkiln Artists, and we talked about this in our Discord with patrons and stuff. This one I picked up a bunch of. Uh, it's great because when you cast an instant resource, you make a treasure, and whoosh, you can get treasures so fast. Yeah. I mean, we even got two win conditions in Magecraft from Professor Onyx and the um, the Gruel Magecraft trigger that allowed you to drain. So um, I think Magecraft did a lot for Commander, and it's very, very strong, and they should be careful about reprinting. Or Golgari. It was Golgari. Golgari, sorry. Yeah, I can't, right, I can't right. name it, but there, there is infinite Willow, combats that, that go Willow. with... Um, yeah, even the Witherbloom Apprentice. Yeah, that's the one. All right. Myst- We're on our last one. We are. For Mystical Archive and Bonus Sheets, which we saw in Time Spiral Blocks, Strixhaven, Modern Horizons 2, and Brothers Do you like War. these? I like having them thrown in. I don't open packs for them, but it's nice when you're like, <laughs> I just, I got a demonic tutor. When they... When they first were bringing these out, I was concerned about the uh, like the financials behind the sets because I like investing in sealed products. And so when there's bonus sheet cards that are expensive, it makes it so the rest of the set's not very expensive, okay. which is good for constructed. It's good for most players who are buying singles and stuff. Um, but for sealed product, it's not always the best. So I was mm. a little concerned, but opening the packs, heck yeah, I like it. Oh, it's really open fun. Some packs. <laughs> yeah. All right, so it's a very popular mechanic. Bonus sheets in general have always been a fan favorite, and the Mystical Archive particularly was a runaway hit from Strixhaven. Bringing back popular reprints is always a recipe for success. My only gripe with Mystical Archive was, um, I think, the the tiny little foil etching versions of the cars. Oh. Like the full foil versions, the non-foil, and then there's bits are The, the ones with the Mystical Archives where it's like just the, the, out, the, the little bubbles around the yes. names and the... Those ones you're like, are these actually? Oh yeah, no, they're foil, but I have to hold it at this angle. Ugh, that's the one. That's my one gripe. Otherwise, awesome. The design space is medium. Um, it, I mean, obviously they can reprint cards if it's on a brand new set. Maybe it would be a little bit difficult to reprint old cards, but I'm sure they'd be able to wait. Have ways to associate it to that particular theme or plane. Versatility is neutral. One of the things R and D cares about that a bonus sheet is integral to the set it's included in. We saw this with the Brothers War set having all of the artifacts on these extra things. Um, so uh, in in Strixhaven with the Mystical Archive, there were a lot of lots spells. of cool spells that were stored in the library there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, development play design is not problematic. Um, the only thing this is changing is your limited environment, uh, which actually brings kind of a really cool twist to it. Um, Casting Demonic Tutor in a, in a sealed event seems fun. Playability is not affected. These are um, straightforward cards that get reprinted. I mean, I guess if you print a card that requires playability, then it's on the individual card and not on the bonus sheet themselves, um, which makes bonus sheets on the storm scale a four. So we're going to get it back. And at a four, I imagine it'll be annually, maybe one set a year. Yeah. Or, or yeah, even even just, it's just the the, the list, right? Times for out of so I feel like some of these are just they could be almost like the list as well. I so. guess they I guess the list would be probably be a one because for sure we're getting mm-hmm. it with every. Yeah. No, I like these. Mm-hmm. Um, this was fun looking into all these mechanics. I thought some of them were going to be a lot higher. Some were going to be honestly a lot lower. Magecraft is the one that that really had me there. But yeah. it was nice taking a walk back down memory lane of all the mechanics that came out because I honestly I had already forgotten about all the way back like, to Strixhaven, like all the way back to Adamant and Throne of Eldrain. Like I. I honestly, that's unless you're I, drafting, I don't really. That's when I started to be on this podcast was thrown, was after yeah, Throne of Yeah, just Eldraine. after Throne of came yeah. out. Yeah, so a lot of fun stuff there. Um, but that's going to be it for this week, everybody. We thought, uh, or we hope that you, um, you know, enjoyed us chatting about these. Um, not something that we look at too often, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the play design and what what the actual mechanics, how, how they played out as far as mm-hmm. uh, Wizards is concerned and what, what, the, what the feedback was. But um, if you want to chat with us more, you can find me on Twitter at Andy Flores. And you can find me on Twitter at Wormcoil Engine. Make sure to come back next week where we will all join as one entity as we unite under our machine god, Alice Schnorr, and talk about All Will Be One. Uh-oh. See you then.